Kathy. This event is part of Welcoming Week, which is what the City of Dallas Welcoming Communities and Immigrant Affairs Division participates in. And Welcoming Week is an annual week-long nationwide celebration that brings together neighbors of all backgrounds to strengthen connections and affirm the importance of welcoming and inclusive places and achieving collective prosperity. This year's theme, Where We Belong, aims to go deeper and spark individual reflection on ways that we can break barriers so that Dallas can be a welcoming city for all, including immigrants and refugees. We will be having a Q&A session at the end of the panel, so I will be monitoring that and attendees are welcome to send in their questions anytime during the panel. And also, the panel will be recorded for an entire session and we will try to have that recording out on our social media and communication networks. And lastly, attendees can put live closed captioning on in several different languages as well. And I'm going to pass the torch on to Javelin for speaker introductions. Thank you, Thank you Darani. Uh, welcome everyone this afternoon for uh, really talking about the state of refugee, immigrant, and migrant health. I would special thanks to Welcoming Communities and Immigrant Affairs, Parkland Health, and he Healing Hands Ministry, um, who helped make this possible. Um, my name is Javelin Castellanos. Um, refugee, immigrants, and migrants are a vital part of our na nation's social, cultural, and economic viability and fabric. There is growing evidence that COVID-19 posed a threat um, to the entire U.S. population, but also communities of color and certain rim communities were affected disproportionately. A diverse population makeup and various social determinants of health affecting rim communities and having conversations as today's will allow us to better understand how we can work together towards improving the health of our communities. Today, we have two very special speakers with us, Katie Irwin, who is the Director of Population Health and Employee Health at Healing Cans Ministry. Katie Irwin is the registered nurse and the director of population health and employee health at Healing Hands Ministry. She has worked at Healing Hands for six years and loves seeing the positive impact on families and individuals when they have access to quality health care. Dr. Lance Rasbridge is a medical anthropologist who helped found in 1992 the refugee outreach program at Parkland Hospital. Today, he currently continues to support and coordinate the refugee outreach program with Parkland Hospital. He also inaugurated the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex Refugee Network and has served as past president for both Refugee Services of Texas and the Center for Survivalists of Torture. With Charles Kemp, he authored Refugee and Immigrant Health, a handbook for healthcare professionals. Today, we wanna to thank you both for joining us this afternoon, and I'm gonna hand it over to Katie to begin this conversation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me on today. As Javelin said, I'm representing HHM Health. Um, when we were founded, we were Healing Hands Ministries, but last year we rebranded and so we are now known as HHM Health. I am a registered nurse and I am the Director of Population Health and Employee Health here, and I've been here for about six years now. I am not seeing the slides. Are they going to come up? While we're waiting, I, I'll give you just a little bit of an introduction to HHM Health. We were founded about 15 years ago to provide access to health care uh, to those who have less access than others. So we serve all patients, but the majority of our patients um, are uninsured or underinsured, and uh, we were founded for that purpose. Um, as I said, we were founded about 15 years ago, and about in 2016, about six years ago when I started here, we opened up our second uh, physical location in the Vickery Meadows community. So. Um, from the beginning, we have served immigrant and refugee populations, and then we um, became even more committed to that when we moved into the Vickery Meadows community. Next slide, please. 
So at HHM Health, we are a patient focused community health center. We provide health care to all, including the uninsured and underinsured communities. We are focused on providing really high quality health care as um, our UDS metrics demonstrate. And uh, we're focused on health equity and expanding services to the community, both by letting more of the community know that, that we're here with the existing services that we have, and we are also looking to expand the services that we offer. Next slide, please. So a few fast facts about us. Year to date in 2022, we have served 14,280 unique patients. And our patients, uh, the majority of our patients do fall into the category of immigrant or refugee, uh, although not all of them are immigrants or refugees. We have currently three physical locations. Uh, the first one is at 8515 Greenville Avenue, which is Greenville and Royal. There we have a family practice clinic, a dental clinic, and behavioral health services. At 5750 Pineland, our Vickery location, we have a women's health clinic, a pediatric clinic, a family practice, and our Rosewood Vision Center. And at 8335 Walnut Hill Lane, which is our Wood Hill location, we have a pediatric clinic. Next slide, please. So our service lines that we are able to offer to the community are behavioral health, dental, family practice, pediatrics, vision, and women's health. Next slide, please. So I'll tell you, I'll share with you a little bit about our patient breakdown. Um, as I mentioned, we this year have served 14,280 patients. Um, Age-wise, that breaks down into 35% children and 64% adults. We serve 64% women and 36% men. Next slide, please. Uh, for ethnicity and race, so the, the data that we collect for ethnicity is either not Hispanic or Latino or Hispanic or Latino. So 46% of our population is Hispanic or Latino and 53% is not. And then on race, um, we serve 53% uh, white, which includes both Caucasian and Latino. Uh, we serve 17% Asian and then 26% Black or African American uh, with small categories in um, American Indian or Alaskan Native, uh, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander or people who decline to specify. Next slide, please. Our patients speak around 68 languages, so that's one of the um, special challenges and joys of serving the refugee and immigrant population. And I'll touch more later on what we do um, for those patients. But here you have a representation of some of the most common languages spoken in our clinics, um, with the majority being English, followed by Spanish and then Burmese. We serve a large population of patients from Myanmar. Next slide, please. So in our family practice health centers, we see adults. Uh, we do annual physicals where we, uh, of course, do screenings for uh, different types of cancer, heart disease, and other common conditions. We do education and treatment for chronic diseases such as diabetes and hypertension. We provide flu shots and vaccinations. And then, of course, we do sick visits um, for cold, cough, and flu type symptoms. Next slide, please. In our women's health center, we provide obstetrics and gynecology services. We care for women all throughout their pregnancy. Um, we provide family planning. We have a grant with Trust Her that helps us uh, be able to provide birth control to our patients. We provide routine and yearly examinations. Uh, we do some office-based procedures and we provide pap smears and cervical cancer screening, which is a really important part of our screening program. Uh, we also provide pap smears and cervical cancer screening in our family practice clinics as well. You don't have to come separately to our Women's Health Center for that. Next slide, please. In our pediatric health centers, we provide uh, all of the well child checkups that are needed throughout the first years of life and then annually as the children grow older. 
We, of course, do sick visits. We provide all of their childhood immunizations and we treat chronic childhood diseases. Next slide, please. Uh, in our behavioral health center, we have uh, three counselors who provide treatment for depression, anxiety, trauma, PTSD, and some chronic mental health disorders. As you can imagine, um, in the refugee and immigrant population, we see a lot of these conditions due to the life situations that these people have come out of. Next slide, please. In our dental clinic, we provide annual checkups, routine cleanings, x-rays, uh, and we're also able to do root canals and crowns. Next slide, please. Uh, in our Rosewood Vision Center, we do vision care for adults, seniors, and children. We're able to offer annual eye exams. We give prescriptions for eyeglasses and contacts, and we also have a program where our patients can get their glasses at free or low cost, um, and they can actually uh, pick them up from us in, a, in the clinic. Um, we also coordinate vision care related to chronic diseases, such as retinopathy with diabetes. Next slide, please. We are also, as I mentioned, expanding our services. So at our location on Pineland in Vickery Meadows, we recently renovated the third floor of that building and our administrative offices are located there, but we are also expanding our healthcare services there. So we will be opening a 340B discount pharmacy later this year. Um, we will also be opening an imaging center where we'll be able to provide mammograms, sonograms, x-rays, and bone density screenings. We have education classrooms where we can provide health education classes. And then um, outside of that location, we are also getting ready to open our first school-based clinic in the Metroplex. Next slide, please. So I wanted to share with you some of the most common uh, medical needs that our patients have. We see a lot of patients who have prediabetes and we treat a lot of diabetes. Along with that, of course, um, we see a lot of the complications of diabetes, including retinopathy, which we're able to identify in our vision clinic, um, neuropathy and kidney failure, to mention a few. We treat a lot of hypertension. Um, we're actually about to start our first remote patient monitoring program so that we can give out um, home devices where patients can monitor their blood pressure at home and receive um, more frequent treatment and guidance from their medical provider uh, to keep their blood pressure under control. Elevated cholesterol is one of the common um, issues that we see. Asthma, as I had mentioned, depression and anxiety, um, as you can imagine, are most of our patients have gone through traumatic life experiences in their journey from their home country to um, fleeing their home, perhaps living in a refugee camp, immigrating to America, and then adjusting to life in the United States. So those are um, common issues that are both our providers and our counselors help to treat. Uh, we also see a lot of hypothyroidism. We see a lot of patients for obesity and overweight issues. Um, we have a lot of women who come to us for fertility issues and menstrual cycle abnormalities. We provide birth control, as I mentioned earlier. So that's a big need in our community. We also treat patients, a lot of patients for anemia, acid reflux and abdominal pain, back pain and joint pain, and then of course, cold, flu, and COVID-like symptoms. Next slide, please. So these are our top 10 diagnosis codes that have been used within our visits for this year. So actually the top two are both related to vaccination. So as you can see, we do provide a lot of vaccinations. We, um, we do a lot of childhood vaccinations um, through the TVFC, the Texas Vaccines for Children program. Um, and we also have the Adult Safety Net program. So we're able to provide vaccines for our uninsured adults as well. Um, our next most commonly used diagnosis is for obesity. 
Um, and then matching up with that, dietary surveillance and counseling, exercise counseling, uh, prenatal care in the third trimester, vitamin D deficiency, uh, elevated body mass index, uh, mixed hyperlipidemia, which goes along with high cholesterol, and uh, encounter for routine child exams. Next slide, please. So our patients, of course, have a lot of needs in the area of social determinants of health which are the factors of life that affect your health, but are not directly your health. So on the left, you see some of the most common needs that our patients tell us about. I would say the most common one we hear about is transportation. Um, <clears throat> one of the ways that we meet that need is by being located in a neighborhood in Vickery Meadows where our patients can actually walk to our location. But of course, if they need to go places where it's outside of walking distance and they have transportation issues, then that has a big impact on their life. Excuse me, just one moment. Um, our patients also talk to us a lot about housing issues. Um, they Most of our patients have housing, but they may be worried about losing their current housing or they may be in an unsafe home situation either due to domestic violence or sometimes the physical condition of their home. Um, they may have mold or um, their, their apartment may be in ill repair. Um, employment is one of the issues they talk with us about. Um, unemployment is a problem. Also, we have patients who have a job, but it doesn't generate enough income to support their family. Educational resources for both children and adults is a need. Um, our patients need assistance enrolling in Medicaid and SNAP. That is something that we are able to provide on site. We have care navigators who do assist our patients with those enrollments. Some of our patients are struggling with food security. Um, language barriers, of course, are a big issue. Literacy, um, a lot of our patients need help with immigration issues. And then another major one is prescription assistance. And some of the things that we do to help with prescription assistance is, you know, our providers are very adept at um, prescribing low cost medications when possible. Uh, we also use prescription assistance programs to help patients get medications that they would otherwise not have access to. And uh, we utilize uh, a, a charity pharmacy, St. Vincent de Paul, um, if our patients qualify for that charity pharmacy, then their medications that are available there are free of charge. And as I said, we are also going to be opening our own discount pharmacy in our Vickery Meadows location. Um, on the right here, I've told you some about our translation services. So of course, caring for folks from other countries, um, most of our patients speak another language. Sometimes they speak English as well, but they're their first language was in English. So <clears throat> a few of the things that we do to help with that um, is we employ five translators. So among our translators, they speak more than five languages, which I find very impressive. Um, Burmese, Rohingya, Kachin, Hakachin, Matuchin, Malay, Kareni, and Urdu. So they are just I can't say enough about our translators. They are just wonderful employees who just have such a heart to help our patients. And um, personally, I can attest that uh, when uh, when I've done one-on-one uh, -on -one education sessions with patients who need translation, it just makes all the difference having that translator there in the room, able to help that person um, with their um, with uh, speaking in their heart language and making sure that they are understood by their medical provider. Um, in our clinics, we employ mostly bilingual staff who, who speak both Spanish and English. And then we also have a language line so that if the translator is not available or the patient speaks a language that we don't have a translator for, we are still able to communicate with them. And we have have phones in almost all of our exam rooms so that we can dial up that translator and have them on speakerphone during the visit. Next slide, please. Um, so 
HHM Health is actually um, working on launching a pilot to formally screen for these social determinants of health. Up until now, of course, we know that our patients have these needs, but we're finding out about them informally through conversation at their visit. So we are about to launch a formal uh, program to screen um, for their social determinants of health needs. So we will be using a standardized form called the PREPARE form that stands for the protocol for responding to and assessing patients' assets, risks, and experiences. Um, through the needs identified through that form, we will make referrals either to our behavioral health department or to our case management department. And um, they will connect the patient either with behavioral health appointments as needed or with community resources. Our case manager is going to be using findhelp.org to connect our patients with those community resources. You may or may not be familiar with findhelp.org. They are a website where you can do a zip code search and be connected to a, a whole array of community resources in different categories. Um, so we've actually contracted with them um, and they'll be integrating into our electronic medical records so that we can provide those resources to our patients directly. But you can access them yourself just by going to findhelp.org. Next slide, please. We also provide COVID vaccines and COVID testing at HHM Health. We offer COVID vaccines in our clinics as well as on a community walk-in basis. We've done some mobile offsite COVID vaccine clinics as well, and we provide COVID testing in our clinics. Next slide, please. In the Population Health Department, which is my department, uh, we are focused on projects that um, where we do outreach to let the community know that HHM Health is here to serve the needs of the community. And we also do projects to help elevate the health of the entire population. So some of the things that we have done are shared medical appointments, where we have a cohort of patients who have a similar diagnosis, such as diabetes, and they're able to see the doctor at that shared appointment, but they're also, they also receive a lot of valuable health education from nursing, from a dietitian, from a counselor. As I mentioned, we've done mobile COVID and flu vaccine clinics to help let the community know that we're here and provide a valuable service to them for their health. We connect patients to care. Um, we get notifications that our patients have been admitted to the hospital or the emergency room, and we reach out to those patients to make sure they have follow-up with us. Uh, one of the community outreach events that we've done recently is a back to school fair and clinic. Um, we offered uh, backpacks to children in the community full of school supplies. And we also did a clinic where we did free back to school physicals and offered immunizations. And then we also focus on health education for things like COVID, nutrition, exercise, and family planning. Next slide, please. So to wrap up, um, here are the access points. If you have patients who are needing our services, the first step will be for them to enroll as our patient. Our enrollment office is located at 5750 Pineland Drive on the third floor. I've listed our main number and our website here um, for more information. And then here are, again, the addresses of our three current locations. Next slide, please. Well, thank you so much for having me today. I'm happy to share about the services we can offer to the community. Um, and here is my email address if you would like to reach out to me directly or you have any questions. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. So thank you, Katie, for that uh, excellent presentation. My name is Lance Rasbridge. I coordinate the Refugee Outreach Program for Parkland Hospital. Uh, I'd like to kind of follow up where Katie left off and give a little bit more of a face uh, to the uh, populations that we're discussing here, primarily the refugee uh, population. In the process, then I will also talk about the Parkland Refugee Outreach Program, which I coordinate. 
Could I have the slide, please, Yolanda? Yes, bear with me. I'm trying to put you on the screen as well. <laughs> so you just bear me just one second here. Let's see. There we go. Um, and to share. Sorry. There we go. So here is my contact information. I think it's going to come up again at the end, but uh, lance.rasbridge at phhs.org. Uh, would love to speak to anyone individually if they have more questions that don't get answered either in my presentation or in our Q&A at the end. Next slide, please. So before we um, talk about the specifics of Dallas, I want to do it just a little bit of a background on uh, the population that we're talking about in the global perspective. So probably we all know, but let's review it one more time. Political refugees defined by the Geneva Convention of 1951, which created the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, defines a refugee as someone outside of their country of origin unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin. Why? Because they have a well-founded fear of persecution, and that form of persecution can be on the basis of race, religion, ethnicity, membership in a political party, or social group. So by that definition, there's about 30 million people in the world today in, the, in those situations. If we modify the definition just slightly to count people that are still within their country of origin, that number is all the way up to 80 million individuals. So of that 30 million uh, that are specifically political refugees by this definition, next slide please. About half of them are in refugee camps, such as this camp on the Thai-Burmese border, uh, where uh, lots of ethnic Karen from Burma have fled into Thailand and are, are living in refugee camps. Uh, refugee camp conditions vary greatly depending on what country is hosting them and what organizations are involved, but all of them are pretty bad, pretty tough uh, circumstances to survive in, often described by the refugees as a place where we are halfway to nowhere, kind of in a limbo period, sometimes for entire generations. Next slide, please. The uh, remainder, the other half roughly of the refugee population are known as urban refugees. So they're basically squatting um, wherever they can uh, in the country that they first fled to, uh, surviving just on savings, living on the street, obviously are subject to uh, all kinds of abuses and trafficking and whatnot. Could I have the next slide there, Yolanda? So this is a picture showing Syrian uh, refugees squatting in an abandoned building in Amman, Jordan. Next slide, please. Uh, related to refugees uh, are the concept of asylum seekers and asylees. So uh, unlike a refugee uh, at first, an asylum seeker is someone uh, from the U.S. perspective who is inside U.S. territory, inside the, the boundaries of the United States, and they petition the United States government to remain uh, and they petition that they cannot uh, be returned to their country of origin due to having that credible fear of persecution, which we talked about in the definition. So once, uh, if they succeed in convincing the government via immigration court uh, that they do indeed have that credible fear of persecution, uh, then, then they become an asylee, and at that point they're technically a refugee like um, 
the other refugees that are resettled into the United States. Uh, take just a minute to, to look at the slide, if you will. This is uh, a group of Venezuelan uh, asylum seekers crossing the Rio Grande River uh, from uh, Piedras Negras, where I, I shot the picture from the Mexico side, uh, crossing into uh, Eagle Pass. Uh, very harrowing uh, journey, to say the least. Uh, it uh, really struck me uh, to look at these people, uh, I think we need to step back a minute and just realize you know, the desperation and the, the circumstances that, that someone would find themselves in, that they would choose to risk their lives, literally, with nothing but uh, barely the clothes on their backs, um, toting children, as you can see the woman on the, the far right, um, several other, uh, or a baby on the far right and several other children, um, and not even that, but this exact spot where uh, this crossing occurred that I was able to witness, um, 24 hours earlier, eight migrants had drowned in the very same spot. And all these people knew that. Uh, they knew that the river was high. There was severe flooding at the time, and still they were willing to risk their lives. So it just points to the, the intensity, the level of desperation, I think. We never need to forget, we can't forget that when we're working with this population of, of the background of, of how they eventually got here. So in this case, um, these Venezuelans will uh, surrender themselves to uh, immigration on the U.S. side um, and ask for political asylum. And uh, incidentally, it's usually the uh, Venezuelan population of late that is caught up in the whole busing issue uh, where uh, Governor Abbott and, the, and uh, a couple other border states are beginning to pack some of these uh, immigrants in buses and send them up to, to the north, northeast, Washington and New York and Chicago. Uh, again, uh, they're requesting political asylum to remain in the United States. They cannot go back to Venezuela because of their well-founded fear of persecution. Next slide, please. So how does one get resettled to the United States? Uh, very, very uh, complex issue, uh, well beyond the time that I have to uh, discuss it here in any kind of detail. Uh, but, but know that of all those global refugees, far less than 1% ever even get the opportunity to resettle to the West, to countries like the United States. Um, so it's it's a, a, a very small amount of refugees globally that ever get resettled to the West. It just so happens that North Texas and Dallas has been uh, for decades a pretty prime place to resettle refugees. Uh, some of the reasons include that there are four uh, local affiliates of national refugee resettlement agencies here in the area. Uh, there is a high level of uh, high number of entry level employment opportunities. Uh, for example, companies like Texas Instrument, Walmart, Tyson, and many others um, actively seek uh, re uh, resettled refugees as employees. They know how determined and hardworking they are and how how excited they are to to be in the position to be able to escape that persecution and get on with their lives and build a better life for themselves. Uh, at least until fairly recently, there has been ample and affordable housing in our Dallas, uh, North Texas area. If we have a chance, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more at the end. Uh, Dallas, Fort Worth is, of course, a very multicultural area already, so it's a little bit easier for refugees to integrate into the, the fabric of our culture here. And also, uh, very importantly, we have a welcoming political environment in the city, uh, county level. Not so much at the state level, but we'll leave that uh, aside at the moment. Uh, next slide, please. So that brings us to a description of the Refugee Outreach Program, uh, which was founded uh, 30 years ago in 1992, uh, primarily at that time to help deal with the 
large influx of Southeast Asian refugees that were coming into, at that time, the East Dallas uh, area. Uh, the goal uh, from the beginning uh, has been to provide primary care out in the community where refugees are living, ultimately to cut down on inappropriate uh, emergency room utilization at Parkland and, of course, all the other surrounding hospitals. Uh, from the beginning, um, I've always stressed how important it is to make services, as Katie has also pointed out, accessible to the refugee population. Uh, so primary, uh, primarily in the accessibility issue is location. Are you in a place close enough to where the refugees are living that they can uh, access. Uh, so we have actually uh, developed a program um, that has some flexibility in it in that we've been in five different locations uh, since the beginning of, of the program in 1992, beginning in East Dallas, uh, working very closely with refugee resettlement agencies when they start to target other parts of town we have a little bit of flexibility to be able to, to move to where that is. So over the years, we've been in Oak Lawn, uh, we've been in uh, Spring Valley Coit area, uh, a couple other places around East Dallas, and then most recently, we are located in the Vickery uh, Meadow community, specifically at the Vickery Health Center, the Parkland um, COPC site that is in the, the Vickery Meadow uh, area. Uh, that location serves uh, refugees pretty well because, as uh, Katie pointed out, that Vickery Meadow area is uh, uh, has a high concentration of refugees, has had a high concentration of refugees for many years. A secondary uh, site of refugee resettlement is in the Audelia 635 Forest Lane corridor area. And that too is not too far away from the Vickery Meadow uh, community. Uh, they, the, those folks that live within Vickery Meadow can actually walk to uh, the Vickery Health Center because it's, it's that close. Those in the further northern community uh, need to, to take some kind of transportation, uh, but it's not too far away. Uh, outside of uh, location accessibility, um, we also consider cultural and linguistic factors in uh, accessibility, how um, are patients from other cultures, other ethnicities going to be comfortable? Uh, will their language be supported? So we've worked very uh, hard from the beginning to hire former refugees themselves. Uh, in many cases, you're looking at here a uh, Cambodian uh, nurse uh, practitioner working with a uh, Cambodian mother and, and daughter. This slide goes way back. Uh, now the ethnicities have changed, of course, but we've still tried to uh, bring people on staff from as funding permits uh, from the refugee communities, speaking the same language as the uh, refugees themselves, and also serving as sort of a cultural broker um, to help the medical professionals understand a little bit more about uh, the cultures of the refugees and vice versa for the refugees to understand a little bit more about the medical community that they're that they're now entering. Well, we provide primarily chronic uh, illness treatment and uh, pregnancy care from referrals from the Dallas County Health Department Refugee Screening Program. So we work very closely with the Dallas County Program um, to take those cases that have issues of health problems beyond which the health department takes care of themselves. So essentially everything outside of communicable disease issues like tuberculosis and uh, what not sexually transmitted diseases uh, we pick up those cases that uh, are diagnosed with hypertension, diabetes, chronic illness, and, uh, and pregnancy, as I mentioned. Uh, our goal from the beginning has been to, to give the refugee a head start in the resettlement process. 
uh, to meet their health needs initially so that they can as soon as as possible go on to to employment and to self-sufficiency, which is the goal of refugee resettlement. Um, at one year or so, uh, we try to wean the uh, refugee into more mainstream Parkland services, if that's the direction they wish to go, or we encourage them to utilize other providers like Healing Hands, which uh, Katie described so excellently, uh, and perhaps the, the best solution of all when it's available is to pursue employment, employer-based um, health care when it's offered to the, to the uh, refugee. Uh, we do some other outreach efforts as well. Uh, we've uh, partnered with lots of different community organizations uh, in providing COVID vaccine for refugees. Uh, Javelin, who's on our call here, is the chair of the committee um, that is, has been formed to make sure that we focus on the RIM population when we're providing refugees, uh, when we're providing COVID vaccine for, for the RIM population. Uh, we know how vulnerable they are. Um, Healing Hands has been a great partner in that. Uh, the city and the county and the United Nations Association, to name a few other participants in that great coalition that is still ongoing. Uh, next slide, please. So briefly, uh, let me describe four populations in a little bit more detail. Um, there are dozens of ethnicities and countries of origin uh, which uh, refugees come from, but the four largest that we see in the refugee outreach program are those from Cuba, uh, who come typically over land. So imagine, if you will, uh, Cubans come all the way uh, through Ecuador, working their way up the Darien Gap through jungle conditions, very hazardous conditions, uh, all the way through Central America, present at the border uh, and claim asylum. Uh, because that journey is so arduous, there's very few elderly uh, that, that are able to make that journey. So the population of Cubans we see tend to be largely male and uh, young men, but not completely. Uh, coming from Cuba with socialized medicine, these, these uh, patients are usually pretty familiar with uh, Western medicine concepts. Um, the interesting thing about Cubans is uh, they're pretty self-sufficient, speaking Spanish. Um, they're scattered throughout, dispersed throughout Dallas County and beyond. Um, usually can access services pretty well on their own. Next slide, please. Uh, second largest, uh, well, an another large community we see are the Rohingya from Burma. Katie touched on them a little bit. Uh, this is a group that is stateless. Uh, they never uh, were incorporated into Burma in any way legally, or a lot of them were uh, did not even have access to education and healthcare opportunities. Uh, many of them fled uh, ultimately to camps, refugee camps in Bangladesh, uh, predominantly Muslim. Uh, speak uh, Rohingya, some of them speak Burmese, but not all. So this is a case where it's it's kind of interesting. Their country of origin is Burma, but we can't assume that they necessarily even speak the Burmese language. Uh, coming from camps, uh, it's not unlikely uh, to see three and sometimes even four generation families uh, who all fled together. Uh, and overall, they have relatively limited experience with Western medicine. Next slide, please. Uh, another group we see are Congolese from the Democratic Republic of Congo, similar to Rohingya. Not a whole lot of experience with Western medicine. Epidemiologically, their profile can include like tropical diseases that we don't usually see here in, in the medical community like malaria, schistosomiasis, um, other um, intestinal parasites. Uh, they too primarily have come from refugee camps where they've been for many, many years, sometimes generations. It's a multi-ethnic multi community, primarily speaking Kinyarwanda and Swahili. Again, coming from camp environments, uh, not uncommon to see three and, and even four generation families at times, so a lot of elderly in this population. 
and uh, predominantly Christian. Next slide, please. Uh, by far the largest group of uh, refugees we see now are originally from Afghanistan. We've seen Afghanistan refugees ever since I began this work decades ago, um, typically through the special immigrant visa uh, program, which is intended to give uh, access to refugee resettlement to those Afghan nationals that had close relationships with the US military over the years in Afghanistan where they served as interpreters and guides and fixers uh, with the realization that when the United States pulled out of, of Afghanistan, they would be particularly vulnerable. So the initial waves of Afghan refugees were uh, young, educated, typically speaking English pretty well because they were interpreters uh, and urban. More recently, as everyone knows, uh, with the fall of Afghanistan just a year ago, uh, the United States began a massive uh, resettlement program of 80,000 Afghan nationals uh, brought to the United States, airlifted literally out of the United uh, out of uh, Afghanistan, uh, brought temporarily to military bases, and ultimately integrated into communities like like ours in the uh, North Texas area. There's at least 2,500, if not uh, many more, of, of these Afghanis uh, now. Um, it created some problems in the resettlement uh, industry in that there just wasn't enough housing to, to place this massive group that came all of a sudden. So many were placed in temporary housing, uh, including extended stay hotels and I'll touch on this briefly. Uh, now uh, that housing around the, the typical area where refugees used to be placed in the Vickery Meadow area and that corridor slightly north at 635 uh, has become very saturated. There's very limited availability of apartments left. So we're seeing a trend where the agencies are relocating some of, the, some of these folks and some new arrivals to Arlington and to Tarrant County. So for the first time in, in my career, uh, refugees are being resettled by Dallas area refugee resettlement agencies outside of Dallas County. So this creates some problems for um, continuity of care. If they start with the Dallas County Health Department are referred to Parkland, but then ultimately move to out of county uh, they, they really need to get services in that county. Uh, humanitarian parole is uh, how most of the recent Afghans uh, came into this country. They don't yet have paths to citizenship like uh, other uh, Afghan refugees before them had. There's uh, presently uh, uh, some, some laws being proposed uh, to grant them full refugee status, which would include a path to citizenship, but that is still um, being litigated in the courts and in Congress. And uh, the interesting thing about Afghan uh, refugees, unlike many other refugees which I have seen, uh, the refugee process of resettlement typically takes many, many years. Um, but in the case of Afghans, they fled so quickly and were brought to the United States. And if you recall, there was quite a bit of violence around that time and, and uh, a lot of violence at the airport in itself. We actually saw some bullet wounds um, um, and other uh, types of trauma that were, that were very fresh in this group. So just kind of a, a medical curiosity there. And then uh, real quickly, uh, if anyone is wondering, are we seeing Ukrainian refugees? A lot of that has been in the news. Actually, not so much in Dallas County. Uh, from what I understand, the Ukrainians that have come in um, and most of them cross the border as asylees, like we saw with the Cubans and with the Venezuelans. Um, they came primarily through California, not so much through the Texas-Mexico uh, border. Um, and those that are in our area are uh, living with family typically in Collin County and in northern areas. So we haven't yet seen, at least in the refugee outreach program, a large number of Ukrainian 
refugees. It's possible that that program will uh, expand and that in the future we will see a lot of Ukrainians. But right now it's Afghans, Afghans, Afghans with some Rohingya and some uh, Congolese and fewer numbers of lots of other groups. So I will quit there. We have, I believe, a little time for questions, but I'll I'll throw it back to Javelin and Dharni. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I have been monitoring the Q and A, and it doesn't look like we have any published questions at the moment, but I do have some myself that I would like to ask to the both of you. And my first question is, what is, what are any advice or recommendations do you have to anyone that is seeking to visit your workplaces and how can they prepare, uh, whether it be paperwork or other factors such as like mentally, physically, emotionally coming in to these appointments? Katie? So for HHM Health, the first step to becoming a patient is to enroll. We have an enrollment office at our location that's at 5750 Pineland Drive in Vickery Meadows. It's on the third floor. And what that looks like is whoever is wanting to become a patient will come to our enrollment office. They'll fill out the enrollment packet and they'll need to present their ID. It does not have to be a US ID. We accept uh, driver's license, passport, um, sometimes immigration paperwork. Um, and so it can be from any country. Um, it does not have to be a US ID. So they'll have to present, but they do have to present a photo ID. And then they will, if they're applying for our sliding fee discount program because they don't have insurance, they will need to present their financials as well. So that could be uh, paycheck stubs. It could be bank statements, a tax return. Um, if none of those are available, we also have an employer verification of income that form that they can take away and have their employer verify and bring back. So that will be the first step to accessing healthcare at HHM. Once they enroll, they will get their first appointment and they can choose which service line they want to see first. So they don't have to see a medical doctor first. If their first choice is dental care, then that can be their first appointment. If their first need is counseling, then that can be their first appointment. Thank you. For the refugee outreach program, it's a relatively closed system in that the referrals are coming from the Dallas County Health Department, the Refugee Screening Clinic, and uh, working very closely with the resettlement agencies that are that are that are doing the work um, of providing services to the refugees. It's not really open to the more general public. By definition, we're only seeing those that have been granted refugee status. But with that said, the Vickery Health Center, um, like all Parkland community-oriented primary care clinics. Um, has walk-in uh, availability for anyone, regardless of immigration status, specifically for the Vickery Health Center Sundays. Uh, there's a walk-in clinic, uh, first come, first serve. Anyone can be seen, um, and they uh, will have access to the Parkland Financial um, uh, programs at that time if they choose to to do that. But like Katie's system, uh, they will have to present some documents to show income level and uh, residency in Dallas County and, and those sorts of things. Um, otherwise, in the larger picture, uh, people that want to get involved with uh, refugees uh, to to assist refugees in their resettlement process, there's great organizations. Katie uh, is housed within the uh, Northwest Community Center on Pineland, 5750 Pineland. They have a multitude of uh, programs, English language and work uh, training, uh, after school tutoring. Um, I would encourage you uh, to, to contact them, the Northwest Community Center. Also, any of the resettlement agencies, International Rescue Committee, Catholic Charities, um, uh, Refugee Services of Texas, um, all are looking for volunteers. 
Uh, the refugee resettlement program from the government's perspective is set up to be a private part, a private public partnership. So there's the expectation that the government will throw a little money into it, but then uh, the hope is that the community at large, beyond just the resettlement uh, agencies per se, will step up and fill that gap to help welcome and uh, help the refugees succeed in their new life here in the US. And my second question is, how can healthcare providers or people not in healthcare, such as myself, that wants to be involved and help out with these available efforts? Yeah, so um, I think I would I would echo a lot of what Lance said. There are a lot of great um, organizations. The, the resettlement agencies all have volunteer opportunities. Um, I've been involved in um, a group of people who help to furnish apartments for new refugee families. So that's a really fun way to be involved. And that's just one example of many, many ways to be involved. Um, as far as HHM Health, uh, a couple of options there are, um, we are a nonprofit organization. And so we are a part of North Texas Giving Day, which is happening this month. So if you um, would like to donate, we would welcome your generosity. Um, and 74 cents of every dollar goes directly to patient care at HHM Health. Um, also, we have a Friends of HHM Health organization, and uh, one of our volunteer opportunities is our community cafe that we host monthly at the, it's in the building where the Northwest Community Center is, and uh, we serve cake and fruit and coffee, and it's a time when our patients and any community member can just come by, have conversations, and so we have volunteers who provide the refreshments and have conversations with the people who come in. Um, if your organization has, is interested in partnering with our population health department in some way, um, perhaps to provide a health education class to your clients um, or potentially to host a, a vaccine clinic in your community, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I think my email address will be shown again in a, in a moment. Um, it's Katie Irwin at hhmhealth.org and uh, we can talk about how we might be able to partner. Uh, Javelin, I don't know if you have Linda Evans's uh, contact for the volunteer guide for uh, refugee uh, work in the area. Uh, I don't have it on the tip of my tongue, but if you search Linda Evans, United Nations Association Refugee Volunteer Guide, uh, that's a wonderful compilation of all the organizations that do work with refugees in the area, and uh, all of them are always looking for volunteers as well. Thank you so much, uh, Lance and Katie, for participating as our panelists today. And thank you so much, Javelin, for co-hosting um, with Parkland Health and WCIA. Um, I feel like it's very important to get these resources and services informed and available to everyone, especially for those in Dallas. And as you talked about, Lance, um, when these refugees are leaving their countries, they go through very um, almost traumatizing, I would say, um, experiences. So it's good to educate and inform others about that so we're more mindful and it establishes more understanding between each other and reinforces our connections with one another within Dallas. So I really appreciate that. And Javelin, I'm going to hand it to you for any closing remarks that you would like to make. 
Thank you, Darani, and thank you, Katie. Thank you, Lance. This was all amazing information that um, it really highlights the work that's being done and the work that we can continue to do together as we move forward in helping improve the health of our community. So um, I really appreciate it, and this event will be recorded and we will be uh, uploading it in different channels. So be on the lookout. And um, last but not least, we will also be sharing our contact information to um, on a slide or we can send it via email with the link for the recording. So thank you all and that um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon and I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.